Welcome to 13 Cubed. In this special collaborative episode with nullsec.us, we're going to do something a little different. But first, it's time for a backstory. I've recently worked on two different incidents in which RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, was exposed to the internet, resulting in a compromise of the exposed system and the systems to which those systems were connected. Shocking, I know. To be clear, I don't mean that an RDG, Remote Desktop Gateway, was exposed. I mean RDP, as in TCP 3389, was exposed directly to the internet. Why would you do that? Well, set that aside for a moment and realize that while it may seem incredibly obvious that that is a very bad idea, it happens. In fact, at any given time, there are large volumes of computers around the world with exactly the same configuration, probably now more than ever with so many people working remotely. In my example, it was a quick matter to look back through logs and determine the usernames associated with the compromise. Let's pick on help desk and admin, which tend to be pretty prominent in many environments. The question that popped into my mind was what passwords were associated with those local accounts? My assumption was that they were weak or otherwise reused elsewhere and disclosed in a previous breach. There were hundreds, in some cases thousands, of brute force attempts until the attackers finally got the correct combination of username and password and successfully established a connection. Bottom line, though, is that sometimes it will be useful to know what password is associated with a given account. Would you agree? It's not like you can just right-click, go to properties, and view the password. It obviously doesn't work that way. Well, Windows uses a relatively, what's the word, legacy algorithm to cryptographically protect those credentials. And that enables us to use a tool like Hashcat coupled with a modern GPU, think RTX 20 or 30 series, and attempt to match a plain text password with the associated hash. To do so for local accounts, all we need is a copy of the SAM and system registry hives from the computer in question. As you may have guessed, this is the system from which we're going to crack those local account credentials. Let's run a WMIC user account get name comma SID to take a quick peek at those accounts and their associated SIDs and RIDs. So now we're going to be using CAPE as we've done in several previous episodes to collect our evidence. There's actually a pre-built target called registry hives that ships with CAPE. So that'll make things easy for us. So we'll run CAPE.exe, dash dash T source is of course C colon, Dash dash target will be registry hives with a capital R and a capital H, no space. For the target destination or TDEST, we'll simply place this on the desktop. We're also going to be using dash dash VHDX. This will tell CAPE to create a VHDX container in which to store our collected registry hives. And that's it. Notice I did have to specify an identifier in this case, hashcat after the dash dash VHDX that is required. It doesn't really matter what you put there, but CAPE is now running. And what it's doing is it's going through in a forensically sound manner and grabbing all of the registry hives from the system. As a reminder, we only care about SAM and system. Once those files have been placed within the VHDX container, CAPE will by default zip that container and the end result will be a zip file and associated console log conveniently placed on our desktop. We'll give that just a few more seconds, and as you can see, it's already done the collection, and at this point, it's simply creating that zip file, which, again, will contain the VHDX file inside of it. And the total execution time, as you can see, was just 46 seconds to do all of that. There is the full path to the file that was created by CAPE, and that's pretty much it. Again, just 46 seconds. So at this point, we're finished with Windows Terminal. We can go ahead and type exit. And on our desktop, we should have those two files. So there's that zip file. And then the console log will show everything that was in that black Windows Terminal window that scrolled by. So that's it. All we have to do is carry that over to our analysis station and continue with our mission. So let's do that. And here we are on that analysis workstation. On the desktop, I've created a folder called registry. And within that folder, I have placed the two files that I've copied from the previous machine, the zip file and the console log. Of course, the only thing that's important to us at this point is that zip file. So let's go ahead and extract it. So I'll right click, go to seven zip and choose extract here. And after a couple of seconds, we will have our VHDX file. To mount a VHDX file in Windows 10 is trivial. Simply double click on it 
and Windows will assign a drive letter and show you the contents. In this case, it's been mounted as the E drive. And now if we go into C Windows System 32 config, we have our registry hives, as you can see right here. All we need are SAM and system. So we'll go ahead and select both of those and we'll just drag them to the desktop. That's it. It'll just copy it right out of the mounted VHDX and onto our desktop. We could go ahead and unmount the VHDX if we wanted to at this point because we are done with it. So now what? How do we go from these two registry hives to hashes? Well, it turns out the hashes are stored within the SAM registry hive, but they are encrypted and to decrypt them, we need the system registry hive along with a third party utility. That's where Impacket comes into play. As you can see, it is a collection of Python classes for working with various network protocols. We care about NTHash and NTLM, for example. So what we're going to be using is a single utility within the Impacket suite to go ahead and extract those plain text hashes. Let's go over here and copy the URL to the clipboard so that we can perform a git clone of this repo. So I'll switch over to Windows Terminal. And as you can see, I am in the desktop directory. So I'll do a git clone and paste in the URL here. We'll give that a couple of seconds. And when it's done, we should have a directory called impacket located on our desktop. And once we change into that, we can then start exploring those utilities. And as you can see, there's impacket. And now we have those utilities. We do need to install some prerequisites, and to do that, we're going to use pip, which is a Python package manager. I actually already have it installed within this Ubuntu machine within the WSL2 environment, but if you didn't already, you would just do a sudo apt install python3-pip, which, as the name implies, will install the Python 3 version of pip. You'll see here that it is already installed, but again, if you don't have it installed, you need to do so. Now it's a simple matter of invoking pip3. So we'll do a sudo pip3. And we're going to specify the install keyword followed by a period, which means this location. And this will install those prerequisite packages, such things as Flask and some various other things for LDAP3 and crypto libraries, things like that, that are necessary for some of those impacket utilities. Notice there's an error complaining about a requirement for LDAP3. I don't really care about this at this point because I'm only going to be using a single utility within this large suite of utilities and it doesn't have any effect on that particular package. So let's go ahead and change into the examples directory. And within that location, you are going to find quite a few Python scripts. The only one we need to worry about is called secret stump py that's what's going to take those hashes and extract them presenting them to us in plain text secret stump.py to run it we'll simply type python 3 space secret stump.py and if i don't specify any parameters you will as expected get the help for using this utility at the very top you can see the version and as you can see there are quite a few parameters we could specify here it can do a lot of stuff Lucky for us though, the syntax is very simple. Think about what we've collected so far, a SAM hive and a system hive, right? All we need to do is feed in those two hives to this utility along with one additional keyword, and that's it. So we'll repeat the last command and simply append a dash SAM, and then guess what? We simply specify the full path to the SAM registry hive, which in my case is under mount C users, and then my user on this particular box is called Davis RG, desktop, and then Sam, because that's where we copied and pasted it from the VHDX, if you remember. And then for system, same deal, dash system, and then the full path to that hive, which is again, mount C, users, Davis RG, desktop, and then system. And then we just need one other keyword at the end, which is local. So if I hit enter here, let's take a look at what we have. First, let's look at the format. We have the user or username, the RID, a landman hash, which is a very, very old hash, and an NT hash. The landman hash that I'm highlighting here starts with AA and ends with EE across the board. 
that is the value of an unset or empty landman hash, which is a good thing because we're certainly not using landman on a modern Windows 10 system, unless you explicitly enable that for some terrible reason. So it's the second hash that we're after. All we need to do now is simply copy what you see on the screen and paste it into something like hashes.txt, which is what I'm going to end up creating. And that will carry us to our final part of this episode. Okay, we're in the home stretch now. And as I previously alluded to, you'll see a hashes.txt file that I've placed on the desktop. If we open that up, I simply copied and pasted the output from the secret stump utility into this file. And this is what we're going to be feeding to Hashcat. Let's go ahead and open Windows Terminal. And at this point, if you want to follow along, go ahead and download Hashcat in the RockU word list that we're going to be using. You'll find links in the description below. And if you haven't already, you may also want to watch Introduction to Hashcat Parts 1 and 2. Check the top right corner and the description for links to that. The word list I'm referring to is pretty basic by most standards, but RockU was one of the first large plain text breaches, and in general, passwords that fall to this are the weakest of the lot. So let's run hashcat.exe, dash A0 for the dictionary attack mode, dash M1000 to specify NT hash, which is the type of hash we're trying to crack, the full path to that hashes.txt file, and then the path to the RockU word list, which I've placed in the word lists directory. And that's it. So when I hit enter here, I want you to pay attention because I am not editing this or speeding this up in any way. This is real time. And as you'll see from the started and stopped times, this took three seconds. So let's scroll up to the top and try to unpack some of this. First off, you can ignore those warning messages in yellow for now. For reference, this computer is running an RTX 2080 Super. For what it's worth, I have an RTX 3090 on order, but it would certainly not be necessary for this particular exercise. So check this out. Right away, we see about half a dozen of these fall. And as I said, we can tell that these are all pretty weak. One in particular jumps out at us as a concern because it's literally admin. So one of these accounts has a password of admin, which is pretty terrible. Let's see who that belongs to by using some additional hashcat options. To do that, we'll clear the screen and rerun hashcat.exe with a couple of additional parameters. So we're going to use dash dash show dash dash username. Once again, dash M1000 for the NT hash, and then we'll point to that hashes.txt file. This will allow us to see username colon hash colon plain text password. And check that out. It is, unfortunately, the admin user that has a password of admin. That's pretty terrible, right? Also check out Carol, Helpdesk, Mike, Peter. All of those seem to have fallen as well. And at the very top, Demo, which has a password of temp temp. So there are at least two more hashes in here that will fall with the help of the Rocky dictionary and rule-based attacks. One additional one may require a larger dictionary and the last two will likely not be cracked, but we'll leave the remainder of the passwords as an exercise for the viewer. In the meantime, we have additional evidence to add to our investigation. So in our fictitious, but based on a true story episode, it was admin admin combined with the fact that RDP was exposed to the internet in the first place that led to the compromise of our environment. Let's recap what we've covered here. We first defined our problem, which was that we wanted to determine the passwords associated with local user accounts on a compromised system. We used CAPE and the registry hives target to grab the registry hives from that system. We then copied the SAM and system hives from the CAPE poll onto our analysis workstation and used a tool within the in packet suite called secrets dump to decrypt the hashes within the SAM hive based on key material from the system hive. As a side note, Windows used to use the RC4 encryption algorithm for that purpose, but in Windows 10 anniversary update, Microsoft switched to AES-128 CBC with an IV or initialization vector. That isn't the legacy crypto I referred to in the intro. 
Once decrypted though, the NT hash is actually the password encoded in UTF-16 Little Indian and hashed with MD4. That's right, MD4, not even MD5. So that's why Hashcat was able to fly through those from a computational standpoint. I hope you found this information useful and maybe it's something you can put to use at some point during your investigations. A special thanks to nullsec.us. Be sure to check out his website for plenty more InfoSec content. And as always, thank you for watching, thank you for subscribing, and I'll catch you in the next 13 Cubed episode.